moving on with the next section. Let's see, one five parent functions. And if we have time, we'll get down to transformations in this video. I'm going to try to hold this video at 10 minutes, uh, since the first video you had to watch tonight was also 10 minutes. Let's see, there are nine functions that we're going to need to memorize, and I gave you a sheet in class Tuesday, and these nine functions are on that sheet. Uh, this is what the sheet looks like, right? Her. Uh, so you can pull out this sheet and kind of follow along and, and graph these as I work them here. And a lot of these you have seen before. I'm going to blitz some of these. Um, the first one is called the constant function. And I said y equals c. Um, but really, c is just any number. So this is the same thing as if I were to say, I don't know, for example, y equals 2. Well, if you have y equals a number, um, that is a horizontal line. y equals any number is a horizontal line. And it's a horizontal line that just goes through y equals 2. So here's y equals 2, horizontal line, there we go. It's going to look like that. And if it makes you feel better, you can put arrows on the end of it. I'm not going to count off if you don't do arrows. So there's the constant function. It's simply horizontal, and it goes through whatever that value is. The identity function, y equals x, you can look at that as a slope-intercept form, where it's y equals 1x plus 0, a slope of 1. It goes through the origin. So I will hit the origin. And then my slope is 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. And there's the graph of the identity function. It is called the identity function because x and y have the same identity throughout. When x is 2, y is 2. When x is 4.5 or 3.5, y is also 3.5. So x and y are always equal to each other. They have the same identity. That's why it's called the identity function. Moving on. Uh, the linear function, mx plus b. Now, this is what we lovingly and affectionately refer to as slope-intercept form. b is a y-intercept, m is a slope, so this will be like y equals 2 thirds x minus 4. Now, let's not do 4. Let's do minus 1. Um, so if I were to graph that, my y-intercept is negative 1, and this should be review, so I'm not going to go over it in detail. My slope is rise 2, run 3, so I'll go up 2 over 3. And I can also go down to n over 3 to give me a third point to graph. And here is this line. Let's see if I can hit those points. It's pretty good. So there's your linear function, mx plus b. And, uh, good. OK, moving on. The square function, this is also called a quadratic. And you also call it a parabola. And this is just y equals x squared. If you forget what these graphs look like, you can always just make an old, boring xy table. So let's say if I plug in negative 2 for x, negative 2 squared is positive 4. So I have the ordered pair negative 2, 4. If I plug in negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1. So when x is negative 1, my y coordinate is 1. 0 squared is 0. If I plug in positive 1, 1 squared is 1. If I plug in 2, 2 squared is 4. And this is what my square function looks like. And when I ask you to graph these, I want them to be accurate. I don't want you to just come in here and say, oh, I know it's a parabola, and it looks something like that. If you do something like what I just did in green, you will lose big points. I want you to hit the points you're supposed to hit on the graph. So there's your parabola. Moving on. Let's see. The cubic function, same thing, except we're going to cube our x value. So uh, let's see. If I plug in 0... If I plug in 0, 0 cubed is 0, so I'm going to hit the origin. If I plug in 1, 1 cubed is 1. If I plug in 2, 2 cubed is 2 times 2 times 2. That ends up being 8. So 2 ends up at 8, which is way up here. This thing gets real steep in a hurry. If I plug in negative 1, negative 1 cubed is negative 1. If I plug in negative 2, you will get negative 8, which is way down here. So this thing's going to come in real steep. It has what's called an inflection right here, and then it goes up. So there's our cube function. The square root function, again, I'm going to, if we made a little table, uh, let's say if I plug in 0, the square root of 0 is 0, so my y coordinate is also 0. If I plug in 1, the square root of 1 is 1. If I plug in 2, Ah, now, the square root of 2, I'm not sure. So I'm going to skip 2, and I'm actually going to go all the way down to 4 because that's the next number where I know the square root. The square root of 4 is 2, so I'll plot the point 4, 2. Um, but if I plug in negatives, like what happens if I plug in negative 1? 
well, the square root of negative 1, uh, that's an imaginary number. We don't deal with imaginary numbers in here, so while that is true, we cannot graph it on your standard xy plane. So this graph is going to look something like that. Starts at 0, 0, hits 1, 1, and then it kind of levels off as you run to the right. How are we doing on time? Wonderful. Let's see. Moving on, moving on, moving on. The reciprocal function. This one's a little bit trickier. I made a quick table. Um, I plug in 1. 1 divided by 1 is 1. I plug in 2. 1 divided by 2 is 1 half. So I have the 2, 1 half. If I plug in 3, that'd be 1 third. And these things are going to get closer and closer to the x-axis. Uh, same thing if I plug in negative 1. 1 over negative 1 is negative 1. If I plug in negative 2, you'll be at negative 1 half, negative 3. And where we really need to pay attention is if I plug in, say, 0.5. So 1 divided by 0.5, you punch that in the calculator, you actually get 2. So when x is 1 half, my y coordinate is 2. And same thing for negative 1 half, you're at negative 2. And this graph actually has some asymptotes. It comes down like this. Then it follows along the x-axis. On the left side, it comes in right here. Then it goes down, approaching the y-axis. And there is your reciprocal function. Your absolute value, a little bit easier. Uh, if I plug in 0 for x, absolute value of 0 is 0. Absolute value of 1 is 1, so I'll go up 1. If I plug in 2, absolute value of 2 is 2. It's going to look like this on the right side, which is a lot like the identity function. But when you plug in a negative number, absolute value of negative 1 is positive 1. Absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. And this thing is going to have a V shape. It's going to have a V shape coming down to the origin. And this is what your absolute value graph looks like. Okay. And then the toughest one of these nine functions, seven minutes, still doing okay. The toughest one of these nine functions, no, that's not where I want to be is the greatest integer function. Now, I did make one little change. Y'all's only has like a single bracket. Technically, it should be a double bracket around the x. Y'all's is just your standard bracket like that. Um, that does mean greatest integer, but this is how it technically should be written. On the graphing calculators, you have to find the int command. So it, int x is the same thing as greatest integer. But that's really just kind of for calculators on paper. We're going to write it like this. And what the greatest integer means, greatest integer of x, what that means is the largest integer. I should have had this pre-written. Not bigger than x. I'm going to say larger. I'll stick with bigger. Not bigger than x. Now remember, integers, if you don't remember, is your whole numbers and their negatives. So 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 3, negative 3, negative 4. No decimals. 1.2 is not an integer. Um, so the greatest integer means you want to find the largest integer, not bigger than x. So I'm going to make a little xy table, and we're going to see what happens to the greatest integer function. Um, so let's say if I plugged in uh, 1.2 for x. And the interesting part of the greatest integer function happens on decimals. Um, actually, let's plug in a whole number first. I'm kind of all over the place here. If I plug in 1, the largest integer that is not bigger than 1, the greatest integer of 1, is 1. 1 is not bigger than 1, so when I plug in 1 for x, I'm going to get 1 for y. When I plug in 2 for x, the greatest integer of 2, the largest integer that's not bigger than 2 is 2. And that's going to happen every time you plug in a whole number or an integer for x. And it's going to look a lot like the linear function or the, the identity function. But the interesting stuff happens when you plug in like 2.3. What is the largest integer that is not larger than 2.3? Well, the, the highest I can count before I pass 2.3 is... 2. So when I plug in 2.3 for x, I'm still sitting at a y coordinate of 2. Same thing for 2.7. The largest whole number, not larger than 2.7, is still 2. So 2.7, I'm still at 2. And everything I plug in between 2 and 3 is going to sit right here. 
And that's the same thing's going to happen between 1 and 2. If I plug in 1.5, I'm going to stay at 1. So you're going to have, looks like a whole bunch of steps. And a lot of people call this the step function. I have a problem with calling it that because its actual name is the greatest integer function. But you may know it as a step function. And then at 2, like right here from 1 to 2, but when I got to 2, I actually jumped up here. So what I'm going to put is an open circle on the right side to let me know that I don't actually include 2. 2 belongs up here. Then I'll go to the right, open circle, and at 3, I'm actually going to jump up to a y-coordinate of 3. Open circle, and this is what the step function or the greatest integer function looks like. It's closed on the left, open on the right, and it looks like this. Greatest integer function is very seldom seen, so people usually forget what it looks like. But that is your greatest integer function. I think I will call it a day right there. Oh, gosh, 11 minutes. Good Lord. Okay, that's enough.